This is Greg Pruitt, formerly of the Cleveland Browns, and you're listening to The Sports Fix. The Fix is in. Call J-Rock now at 216-539-7535. We want to hear from you now. 216-539-7535. Hey, guys. J-Rock here from The Sports Fix, and we always talk about using our platform to try to help the world and the society we live in and everywhere I go and everywhere we go. Bullying is one of the problems in today's society. There's nothing worse than any person, big or small, strong or weak, adult or child, feeling picked on, pushed around, vulnerable and victimized at the hands of a bully. Change comes one person at a time, and my good friends at No Such Thing as a Bully are working on skills and techniques and ways that we can all change and make things better for everyone. Find out more at nosuchthingasabully.com. Portions of the Sports Fix brought to you by Fantasy Jocks. Visit fantasyjocks.com, your fantasy sports superstore. Championship belts, rings, trophies, and more. Live in Ohio, it's time to get your fix. The Sports Fix. Welcome in, everybody. We are live. I don't know if you can hear us or not. I don't know. I don't know what's happening. For those of you joining us on digital delay, nothing's happening. For those of you live, of course, you realize we've once again kicked off the show late here as the entire system crashed. As we were clicking the mic and going on the air at noon, everything crashed. Took nearly a half an hour to get it back up and running again and that is what we're doing we're up and running and we've got now even less time to get going with what we've got going on because for those of you tuned in live we've got a slate of guests coming up mike brandenberry from did the tribe win last night.com bj riddell fantasy football for winners coming your way as well so we've got to get rocking and rolling with the show but uh there'll be some things to talk about in the future as once again continuing to have problems here on the delivery end and uh if you can't deliver the content if you can't just distribute it without uh, difficulties then you start to wonder uh what we're even doing this thing for so that's something for me to deal with and i'll talk about that welcome in you guys to the broadcast live those of you that are with us and of course everybody listening all weekend long friday the 13th weekend why would i expect anything less than that on a day like today. Anyways, I'm ready to rock and roll. I hope you guys are too. Those of you that are with us, if you aren't, find your way back in. Let's do the thing. Welcome in, my friends, to the Sports Fix Weekend Edition, Friday the 13th Weekend Edition. I am your host, the big daddy on the microphone, J-Rock Jerry Myers, here with you guys each and every time we crack the mic live across the Sports Fix Radio Network. Speaking of cracking that mic, adjustments to the schedule once again that we're going to go through here as uh as my schedule's changed my teaching schedule has now gone into the full uh full circle of things here so we'll get into that in a moment adjustments to the schedule of the sports fix but welcome in you guys whether you're listening live on tune in tune in's radio app worldwide spreaker mixler their respective digital and mobile apps as a matter of fact speaking of guys uh spreaker just hit us up the brand new Spreaker podcast radio app. It's a, a special uh, mobile app that they've got going, which is uh, fully customized. Number one, it's got tons of curated programming to help you find some stuff that you may want to listen to. And we are one of the programs that Spreaker selects to recommend to people to listen to. So that's a great bit of exposure for our show. But it's a great way for you guys to listen to the show right on your mobile device. If you've had trouble getting the show, if you're looking for a a one-stop place to get it all, uh, the new Spreaker podcast radio app may be it. You just add the, the sports fix to your favorites, and every time we go live, it'll push notify your phone. Every time we've got a new episode, anything like that, it'll notify your phone, and it'll say, hey, the sports fix, click here and listen, and boom, you're on the air with us live every time we're doing it. So 
If you're looking for a, another way or perhaps a, an additional way or a new way to listen to the show, check that out. Get the new uh, podcast radio app from Spreaker and then add the sports fix to it and see if you enjoy perhaps your listening experience there. But whether you're listening on TuneIn, Spreaker, Mixler, on our website, thesportsfix.net, your home base, your one-stop shop, all those things that we like to call it, whether you're listening on digital delay 24-7, Thousands of you guys around the world who listen 24 hours a day live on iHeartRadio, the world's largest internet radio provider, on iTunes, on Stitcher Radio, SoundCloud, CarPlay, all of the different places that you guys down Stitcher, all the places that you download, feed, subscribe, get your fix, podcast it, all the technical doohickeys, however you do it, thank you so much, and we appreciate it because I say it all the time, without you, I'm just a cat in the studio talking to myself on a microphone with you. We are the Sports Fix, baby, rocking and rolling. As I said today, with me, Mike Brandenberry, did the tribe win last night.com, BJ Riddell, fantasy football for winners as a matter of fact mike's gonna be with us just about 15 minutes from now so first segment cut short i was gonna open up the phones i'll still crack them open if anybody wants to get in but much less time now 216-539-7535 is the number to call and i'll open it on the back end of course if you guys want to get in later 216-539-7535 and remember if you're listening on digital delay if you're a first time listener you guys can call the hotline 24-7 leave your take on anything I can't (laughs) I can't always air some of them but the ones that I can I do so it's a great way to get instant access to the sports fix pick up your phone anytime day or night call and leave your take 216-539-7535 216-539-7535 Of course, social media is the instant automatic way to get through to the show. Facebook.com slash the sports fix. Twitter at the sports fix. C L E email the sports fix at AOL.com. Facebook.com slash the sports fix. Twitter at the sports fix. C L E email us the sports fix at AOL.com. Looking forward to seeing some of you guys this weekend. Erie, Pennsylvania. I'm heading out. Matter of fact, I've got a a very busy weekend coming up here, a lot of things to do, and one of those will be Erie tomorrow, Saturday, excuse me, the uh, eighth anniversary of Pro Wrestling Rampage, the eighth anniversary show. I was on the very first show that they put together, and here we go, eight years later, I'm on this anniversary show, should be a lot of fun, looking forward to being there, looking forward to seeing so many of you guys that listen to the Sports Fix that are out there with us in uh, in Erie when we do the uh, Pro Wrestling Rampage thing. So I'm looking forward to having you guys come on out and join me tomorrow. Should be a lot of fun. I mentioned, too, before I even get any deeper, uh, I've got to get the show rolling here. Changes in the schedule. Uh, the show has already undergone multiple format changes from five days down to three days. Now down to two days a week. Now next week. I will be three episodes. We will be Monday, Wednesday, Friday next week. But that's going to be the last time that the show is going to have that schedule for at least the considerable future. The show is going to only be two days a week after next week. And that's because of my expanded teaching schedule at the Ohio Center for Broadcasting. But it's not going to be the same two days a week. Unfortunately, I'm on one schedule through the middle of December, then I will switch to my more regular schedule from there. So I know it's going to be a bit tricky to follow, but just uh, stick with me. And of course, I'll remind you guys across the social media. But after next week, we will be on the air Mondays and Fridays through Christmas. So through the middle to the yeah to the middle part of December, we will be a Monday Friday live broadcast for those of you guys that listen to us live as my teaching schedule will have me Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday out on the road during the week. But then towards the tail end of December, my teaching schedule changes and becomes Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. So at that point, the show will switch to Mondays and Wednesdays for each week going forward. And that will be for the considerable future at that point until things change. So just a heads up that next week we will be live Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Dan Wismar, Tony Brown, uh, all the usual suspects will be with us. But then beginning 
a week from this coming Monday, the show will slip to a two-day-a-week format live and continue that way for the considerable future due to my new schedule at the Ohio Center for Broadcasting. Still a whole lot to jam-pack into it. We've just got less days a week to do it, so we'll have to get even more crammed into those jam-packed editions of the Sports Fix, you guys. So he uh, heads up on the schedule, and I appreciate you guys' patience on that. Looking forward to seeing some of you guys in Erie this weekend as well. Browns, they're heading up to Pennsylvania too. They've got the Steelers. It's Browns and Steelers week. And look, I've already, we've talked about this a ton about the whole, you know, I get the, to me, the Steelers, the 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 uh, Steelers and the Ravens rivalries, obviously for years, the Ravens different new, but the, the Steelers, I grew up on that rivalry. This to me, not it. And it's, it's not it because of the performance of the Browns. The minute the Browns start, Flipping that script around, and of course they've talked at ad nauseum about digging their way out of the 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 hole in the division and the the difference between the other three teams and the Browns until they become more competitive. It is what it is, and it's just not going to have the bite of any kind of rivalry. Nothing that the Browns do will have the bite of a true rivalry. It'll have some disdain. Fans will always find reasons to get into things, and they'll always find reasons to uh, have issues with other fan bases. And and there is you know at least something there if people. People want to pretend and hang their hat on it, but it's not really there. Not yet. The Browns have to continue to win games like this weekend. Whether you think they will or not, I don't know. Whether they do or not is what's going to change when this becomes a true biting rivalry all over again. Browns have a ton of work to do, and it may not even be as easy. Some fans thought, hey, Big Ben's going to be out this week. May not even be the case. Ben Roethlisberger initially expected to be out two to six weeks with the injury to his foot and it looked like Landry Jones was going to be in there. Still may be the case, but Big Ben out there this week practicing, he may, he's listed as probable for this weekend. He very well may be under center for the Steelers when they take on the Browns from the big ketchup bottle in Pittsburgh. And uh, like I said the other day, Jimmy Haslam may have wrote the check, but Ben Roethlisberger owns the Cleveland Browns since his NFL career began, and uh, he knows how to beat the Browns. That is absolutely for sure. That's something to keep an eye on, you guys. And uh, as well, Landry Jones, even if it's Landry Jones, first off, the six games that he started, Steelers split them. They went 3-3. Three and three. Uh, He's got a guy, you may have heard of him. He just caught 300 yards worth of passes last week. His name is Antonio Brown. He's going to go a long way to making sure that Landry Jones feels a bit comfortable in the pocket. As well, Le'Veon Bell, his replacement. D'Angelo Williams, who I always I always liked him when he played uh, for the Panthers. D'Angelo Williams showed that he can step up. He may not be Le'Veon Bell, but he can pick up the slack as well. And we know the Browns' demonstrative issues stopping the run here this year. So injury or no injury, they're, they're going to be ready to go with the guys that are stepping in. But it may not be anybody stepping in. It may be Big Ben Roethlisberger at the quarterback for the Steelers. And I suspect that that'll be a game-time decision for Mike Tomlin and his crew here come this Sunday when the Browns roll out there. Either way, Browns have tons of their own questions to deal with. Who's going to be their quarterback? Josh McCown, some light work in practice all week this week. Meanwhile, Johnny Manziel, third week in a row, getting the majority of the work with the ones, which A, he needs anyway. That's there's no There's no downside to that. Josh McCown's played enough NFL football that he can get out there on Sunday, do what he needs to do within the game plan as long as he's physically able to do it. So it's nothing bad there. And B, if he's not able to go, you've obviously got to spend more time than usual. Had it been the other way around, you may not have had to give your number. If the number two was a veteran like McCown, he may not have needed a ton of number one work during the week. But with your number two being such an inexperienced, underperforming guy, you need as much work as possible. So he's been working Manziel, that is, with the ones all week. I wouldn't be surprised, surprised, I should say, to see him start. But then again, I would. I think if in any way Josh McCown can get put out there, he will be. And I think it's because Mike Pettin's looking at this as a very key game in perhaps how long he maintains this job and whether or not the front office and and the ownership continues to believe in what they're doing because no matter what the record is it can be 2 and 7 it can be 4 and 12 when it's over whatever the the numbers are 
there's ways that you can keep your job. And one of those is being able to show that you're closing the gap within your own division. Whether that's really true or not, I don't know. But because you've got down years by the Steelers and Ravens, you do have that possibility. If the Browns, if, if the Browns were to win this weekend, if the Browns were to go to, to Pittsburgh, and even if it wasn't this weekend, in general, uh, that would mean in the last two years, they've beaten every team in the division. They've gone on the road and won games in the division. So they have that ability to do just that. And and that is something that you can take to, to Jimmy Haslam and say, hey, look, we're closing the gap. So that's why I think Mike Pettin looks at this game as way more important than anybody else in the fan base does. And that's why I think come hook or crook, if he's possible to go out there, Josh McCown will be your quarterback. Plus, at this point, he still feels that he owes it to the rest of the coaching staff and the players to to put your best player out there to win. And, brother, if you think putting Johnny Manziel in the middle of Heinz Field this Sunday is the Browns' best chance to win, you're absolutely nut. I don't even know if best chance to win has an answer, but you know what I'm saying. And and that's the decision that your coach should be making. And if he wasn't, you should be scratching your head. Because I know for a fact that if he was out there making self-serving decisions, then uh, – You'd be questioning that left and right, but when you want him to make your self-serving decisions and sacrifices, then that's uh, a different story for the head coach. So I expect McCown out there, but I would not be surprised if he's physically uh, still banged up to see Johnny Manziel out there. Either way, I want to see the response by this team. I want to see these these veterans. I want to see Joe Thomas and I want to see Alex Mack and these guys that talk a good game, show some leadership and show. I want to see how they respond. They know that Mike Pettin is under fire right now, and I'm going to see if he's lost this team, if he's ever even had this team. I want to see where Mike Pettin is with his team, what kind of effort comes out, and then I want to see what the hell they do in the second half. Last three weeks, 55-3, to three, I believe, is the lopsided total that the Browns have been overwhelmed coming out of the halftime adjustments with. That is no halftime adjustments. That is one team making adjustments and the other team playing tiddlywinks as far as I'm concerned. That's going to be huge. But how does this team come out? Do they come out flat? Because if they do, that'll say a whole hell of a lot for where they're at with Mike Pettin and with this coaching staff and, and with everything on this season. And I think that's a that, that right there answers a lot of things. Whether you think the Browns can go up there, I don't personally think that the Browns are going to go to Pittsburgh and win. I do think if Roethlisberger was down, And this game was here in Cleveland? Yes, I would say that the Browns could win. I still think that the Browns can absolutely, they can put some points on the board. The the Steelers' defense is bleh. Just like the Browns, well, maybe better than the Browns, but the Steelers' defense is bleh this year. So they'll put some points on the board if McCown's the quarterback. Manziel, that's a much more iffy proposition, but they'll put some points on the board defensively, I don't think that they can contain Brown and, and Williams. And and obviously, if Big Ben's the quarterback, then there, there'll be even more weapons to deal with and more, more to worry about out there. He's a professional Browns killer, but that'll be all stuff to keep an eye on. I do think they score. I still have the Steelers winning this one by 10, maybe 14 points on the road. I mean, 30, 31, 21, 34 24 type of game. I don't know. I'm somewhere in that area with it. Hope they prove me wrong, but we'll find out from the big ketchup bottle here this weekend. We'll talk more about this game in a little bit and a lot more of NFL. We've got BJ Riddell, Fantasy Football for Winners, joining us a little bit later on the show. Buckeyes, they'll be playing again. They get a a last shot at a a blowout here, perhaps. Last bit of respite before they've got the the, uh, the the tough run at the end of the season, the, the Michigan-Michigan State combination. The Buckeyes video, by the way, did you guys see the Braxton Miller video came out this week? I'm the quarterback of the house. He tried a little name drop on him, man. He didn't go crazy with it, you know, but he, he tried to give him the little name drop. Hey, I'm just, you ever you ever watch some football, man? I, I just, I do a little quarterbacking for the Buckeyes. Didn't work. And uh, he, by the way, adjudicated of that issue this week, the misdemeanor uh, driving, uh, driving while, I'm, I'm not sure what the official uh, charge that he pled guilty to was, but I know it was a $400 fine and some probation for the uh, DUI checkpoint that he tried to avoid on campus a couple weeks ago. JT Barrett gets that behind him, and then he'll be back under the center for the Ohio State Buckeyes here this weekend. We'll get some more into that here in a little bit. Let's take a break, get you some news, get back on the track, and get my man Mike Brandenberry in on the conversation, and we're going to talk some Cleveland 
Cavaliers basketball. That is the great thing about this point of uh, the football season is now you can shift gears and talk basketball, and the Cavs are giving you some hellified basketball to talk. Speaking of hellified basketball to talk about, though, man, Steph Curry, the, the other night, did you guys see him? He made that shot from near half court, the three-pointer, while he's getting fouled. Then he blocks the shot, comes back down, makes another circus shot. Steph Curry has been playing basketball on another level, as have the Golden State Warriors. They're 10-0, first team to start with a 10-straight spot to start the season since the 96-97 Chicago Bulls. Meanwhile, Cavs are looking to go to 8, maybe 9-1 and one here this weekend. They've run off 7 in a row. First time that they're they're looking to start a season, first time 8-1 and one since, I believe, Miracle of Richfield time. It's been a long time since the Cavs have had a, a, a hot start to the season like they've had. We're going to talk about some some Cavs hoops here coming up. Mike Brandenberry joins us from DidTheTribeWinLastNight.com. Of course, off his namesake website, we'll talk some tribe as well, some Indians, some Shapiro in Toronto. We tried to have that conversation a couple of weeks ago. We're going to get Mike Brandenberry in on the conversation, talk some Cavs, talk some Indians, BJ Riddell, fantasy football for winners just about a half an hour from now and so much more. Don't go anywhere. Off schedule, off kilter, but we are not off the air. We are live. We are the Sports Fix, and I thank you for joining us. Mike Brandenberry joins us coming up next after the news. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back here on the Sports Fix. Get your fix. Cause it's Friday, you ain't got no job, and you ain't got to do. It's the sports fix. We'll be right back. Hey, guys, before we go to the break, I want to talk to you a little bit again about our good friends at Harry Buffalo North Olmsted, the UFC, the ultimate fighting championships, some of the hottest fights in the world today, each and every one of their huge events. Harry Buffalo is one of the few places in Northeast Ohio you can go there and watch each and every UFC fight at the Harry Buffalo. And let me tell you, I've been there. The people are out the door. They are to the rafters. It is one of the craziest environments for some UFC fights. Wing Mondays, they've got great deals on wings and drinks and every day of the week there's a different special a different deal and don't forget the bison burger the unbelievable it is the combination of a fantastic burger and eating healthy combined into one unbelievable sandwich you have got to get a bison burger while you're there so whatever you're looking for whatever day of the week monday through friday saturday sundays there's something for you at the harry buffalo north olmstead just outside great northern mall check them out today harry buffalo Join the herd. Man, do I love card night. You ready, boys? You got a king? Go fish that. Oh, come on. (laughs) This is WWE superstar Titus O'Neil. The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. Learn more at 877-4DAD-411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Fantasy sports lovers, you put so much time, hard work, and effort into playing week to week that it quickly stops being a fantasy and And starts starts getting getting real. real. And when the smoke clears, you want to show off those victories with a real prize. I mean, a really real prize. Nobody Nobody does does that that like like Fantasy Fantasy Jocks. Jocks. The crew over at Fantasy Jocks have beautiful, high-quality, and heavy-duty championship belts, rings, trophies, and so much more for all your fantasy sports needs. There's literally only one place to go. FantasyJocks.com Sports Fix listeners, do you tweet? So do we. So tweet with us 24-7 at the Sports Fix CLE. Portions of the Sports Fix brought to you by Harry Buffalo. Harry Buffalo, join the herd. Good morning, I'm Bob Picozzi. It was their ninth game, the first time this season the Bulls, uh, Bills have won back-to-back games. Carlos Williams scored on a touchdown catch, Duke Williams on a fumble recovery as the Jets, the Bills beat the Jets 
2217 in Buffalo coach Rex Ryan's first visit to the Meadowlands since the Jets fired him last December. Shady McCoy ran for 112 yards. And I, I think people kind of forget that. Yeah, Rex came back to New York and it's a big game, the Jets. But overall, it's a big game for just us as the Buffalo Bills. I mean, a division game that we must, we had to win. The win moves the Bills into a tie with the Jets and Steelers for first place in the AFC wildcard standings. They are the first defending NBA champ to begin a season 10-0 and since Michael Jordan's Bulls did it 19 years ago. Seth Curry scored 46 last night in Golden State's 129-116 win at Minnesota. The Pennsylvania court has ordered the state government to restore the pension of Jerry Sandusky, who's serving a 30- to 60-year sentence for sexually abusing 10 boys. Their dream of an undefeated season ended at the Final Four. Second-ranked Kentucky opens this college basketball season tonight against Albany 7 Eastern Time on the SEC Network. Start your day at Subway with a freshly made breakfast sandwich like the bacon, egg, and cheese, toasty flatbread with egg, crispy bacon, melty cheese, sauces, and freshly chopped veggies, all toasted to perfection. Breakfast made just the way you say. Subway. Eat fresh. Hey Cleveland, this is Mo Williams and you're listening to Sports Fix. Welcome back to the Sports Fix Live. J-Rock back with you. Mike Brandenberry going to be back with us, back with me here in just a moment. And joining me on the hotline, you guys can keep the conversation going as we get back into it. Facebook, Twitter, email. I know if you're listening on Digital Delay, it seemed like we got to that break quick. We did. And uh, all kinds of technical issues live. But we're rocking and rolling, and it's always better when you get it back on the air. Mike Brandenberry with us here. You guys can keep it going. Facebook.com slash the sports fix. Twitter at the sports fix. C L E email us the sports fix at AOL.com. Facebook.com slash the sports fix. Twitter at the sports fix. C L E email us the sports fix at AOL.com. And uh, be honest with you, if you wanted me to give you anything more than that about the, the Browns and the Steelers this weekend, Try again on Monday. That's all I got, man. Listen back to Monday show. Dan Wismar and I spent like 90 minutes talking about the uh, the Browns. By the way, I meant to mention that at the beginning of the show. A lot of great feedback, and I did want to thank you guys for that. Dan and I had a pretty fun conversation on Monday talking about uh, Bernie Kosar a lot and all of that. By the way, the feedback from you guys. Probably, I'd say nine. Then again, I'm pretty sure. I, I'm pretty sure anybody with a brain could have. Uh, matter of fact, the scarecrow, even maybe without a brain, could have offered his services and gotten a 90 percent approval rate in Cleveland this week. But probably about 90 percent. The feedback that I saw from you guys, uh, even the ones that aren't Bernie Kosar fans, said, "Hell, what can he break that hasn't already been broken?" But most people, very much uh, all about it. And hey, what the hell, man? I mean. You know, you can't do worse and it can only do better, can only do better. So good show, though. If you missed it, Dan and I had a very fun conversation, not just talking about the Browns. We did talk quite a bit about Bertie Kozar and the Browns, but also about the Cavs, which I'm going to get into here with Mike Brandenbury. That's what I say. I'm so glad that we've reached the point of football season where basketball season simultaneously exists because it makes it so much easier. It's like a balm, man. Like, uh, what's it, Jackie Childs on, on Seinfeld? Who told you to get a balm? Who told you to get a balm? That's what the Browns are saying right now because the Cavs are the balm of Cleveland. Not only are they the balm, I- I'm not lying. Sometimes I watch them play ball, and I, I have to check the front of the jersey, and I have to check the, the, that it still says Cleveland because I, I pinch myself, and I go, no, Really? Those guys belong to us because that is one one incredible fun basketball team to watch, and that's what I was saying. Uh, looking at the uh, the the Golden State Warriors, the way they've started, the Cavs, what they've started. I mean, it's two weeks in, but boy, if you if you fast forward to the end, you could totally see it coming right back around full circle. The Warriors, if you have not stayed up late 
and watched any of these West Coast games, do yourself a favor and try to catch something maybe this weekend or something when you I know it's hard because they play late night, but and I, I stay up till all hours in the morning watching sports, but try to catch them because Steph Curry is unreal. They, that game that he had the other night, not to last night, but the night before last, when he's out there, he hit the practically half court falling down shot. Then he hits the clean block. I think it was on uh 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 Doggone it, I can't remember who he was guarding, but regardless, comes right right back down and hits another extensively deep three pointer. He's just he's he's been at another level. And that whole team has. That is a that's a team. They're better, I will say. I did not care. I'm not gonna say didn't care. I didn't respect the true accomplishment of the Warriors last year because I feel that they were very fortunate in their run with the teams that they ran into and the injuries that they they ran into. Still, that's part of winning a championship. The Warriors are a better team than they were last year. Damn, they're good, as are the Cavs. Cavs are twice the team that they were last year. These two teams meet in the finals. There there could be a lot of fun. Of course, they got to get there. But check out the Warriors if you can because they are playing some just some beautiful basketball, much like the Cavs. They play they play ball the right way. That's what I was telling a bunch of guys the other night. I said, man, the hell with, hey, I like LeBron James or this, that. This isn't a flashy, hey, these guys are the best uh, Duncan team or like highlights. None of that crap. This is a team that they will give you the highlights. But, man, they are a, a true basketball. T- if you're a basketball savant, you love the way the Cavs play hoops. They play defense, they rebound, and they pass the ball. The other night, they their first 18 buckets, they had 17 assists. That's unbelievable. They're assisting on everything. That is true, beautiful basketball. It's like that uh, the guy from Semi Pro. Great backdoor pass against the Amigos, my friend. That's the way the game should be played. But I do have to check and make sure that the front of the jersey still says Cleveland sometimes. But uh, we'll talk about that. Let's get Mike in on the conversation. We're gonna talk some Indians hoop or Indians, some hoops, some uh, all kinds of things going on here. You guys, Facebook.com slash the sports fix, Twitter at the Sports Fix CLE. Mike Brandenberry, my friend. How you doing? Mike. Yeah. There oh, we hey, go. sorry. I, I probably scared you. I uh, always have my phone on speaker, and I clicked it over probably just as you went to me, and I, I missed you in the one click. What's going on? Are you staying for the whole conversation today, or are we just going to wet the palate, and then we're just not going to finish? Yeah, yeah, let's see. Let's, you know, we'll just see how the first half goes before I want to make a long-term commitment, you know. Um, so um, the last time I was on, I was just about ready to give my World Series prediction. So I'll just tell you, I was going to take the Royals. So go ahead and, uh, there, there, yeah, we'll just move go. on. Congratulations. You you picked that in, in advance perfectly. Did you have, you sure. know, I mean, good job on that. That was a good World Series, by the way. Uh, the Royals, uh, we were talking, Dan Wismar and I, just about the way, not just the they won the World Series, the way they won all of their, their playoff games. I mean, they, they did so many things coming from behind that had absolutely not been done before that uh, you just take your head off to them and you go, man, hot damn, that team... Uh, that team wasn't going to be denied the way they came from behind. No team had come from behind after the sixth inning as many times in that play in any playoff run as the Royals did there, and no team had won a World Series in the fashion that they did as well, coming from behind and coming from behind multiple runs late. It's just amazing and a testament to the team that they put together. That's a hell of a squad. Some people thought they may take a step back, but they epitomized the term unfinished business. Yeah, I, I definitely, I mean, if you uh, rewind uh, to the beginning of the season, I definitely was uh, someone who thought that they would take a step back. I know Me people too. were picking them to lose 90 games, and I don't think I was in that boat. But uh, I know one of the things I said, I felt like every player that they lost from a year ago to this season, they you know, they replaced with someone that was about 75 or 80 percent as good. And, and when you're a small market team and you do that a lot of times, the the line is so fine and, and the Indians will tell you that, um, you know, the line is so fine between being a contender and, and just being a team in the middle. And that's kind of where I thought the Royals would, would fall back to, but I'll tell you, Jerry, kind of like what you said. I mean, I think they were really from the beginning of the season to the end, um, definitely the best team in the American league and, and the best team in baseball, certainly down the stretch and in October and, and I say this, I guess, partly to to take a jab, but 
but I do seriously mean it. Um, the Royals played this season like like someone offended them by putting the third place team from their division on the cover of Sports Illustrated and said they would win the World Series. I mean, they just played with that kind of piss and vinegar for six, seven months. And, and you talk about, you know, the the comebacks in the playoffs. I mean, that was a team that just wasn't going to be denied. You got that right. And they went out there and they, they, they made it happen. I, w- I, wanna, I don't want to dive into baseball too quick. I wanted to start off talking a little bit of hoops with you. You talked about <laughs> teams that won't be denied. And I th- I'm sure you heard me uh, wax on a little bit about the uh, the Cavs as we started off. But uh, there's teams in the middle. There's teams in the, in the bottom. There's teams in the top, man. And I'm not joking when I say that at least once a game I have to go, man, these are these are these guys are the Cleveland Cavs that we're watching play hoops here, right? Because uh, it's it the, what we've seen, and it's early on. But I mean, realizing the fact that they were missing two now or three uh, guys of their roster, they got Smith back here this week. When you watch these cats play, and look, man, they got a lot to clean up. They're 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 definitely flipping the switch on and off, which is scary in its own right right now but uh man these Cavs just play basketball the right way man how have you been enjoying the first couple weeks of the hoop season yeah a lot of what you just said I think I totally agree with and that um you say you you have to you have to check the jersey because these guys are playing so well and I I kind of agree with the second part of your statement and that they flipped the switch like it's, it's as much as you don't want to rely on that ever for any team, it's it's almost it's almost gratifying to know that they can flip the switch and that you know that they have a gear that they haven't even got close to going to yet um, because they're playing without their starting backcourt and you know for a little stretch there they're playing you know without three guards. Um, I, I think what they're doing maybe against a little bit of a lesser opponent, but it's not their fault. The the schedule makers gave them the schedule that they did out of the gate. But I think what they're doing in a lot of ways is, is as good as what Golden State is doing on the West Coast because the Cavs aren't doing it with their, with their full roster. And, um, you know, I, I saw the Utah game was the first night that LeBron had played more than 35 minutes in a game. Yeah. And so yeah. – you know, in, in a lot of regards, um, they're do, they're doing it as a, as a team effort. Um, this isn't a, hey, jump on my back and and I'll carry you effort. And and I think also too, you know, it's natural. And when we have our baseball conversations, I'm the one that that fights this all the time. But it's natural to compare seasons to one another. And I think you know, if if you look at last year, last regular season. Um, you know, the Cavs let games get away from them a lot of times. I look at that Utah game. They got down nine and maybe it was it late third quarter or early fourth quarter. Oh, and that's a fourth, game that I yeah. think a year ago they would have probably thrown to the dogs and called it a night. Um, where this year I think they put, they have a, they, they might have another gear, but they're playing with a little different level of fire than they did a year ago too. Um, and I think they know they can flip that switch now. You know what, to me, it's just a whole much more cohesive unit from top to bottom. Not just level of fire, level of talent. I'm going to say this, and I, I think that oh, I think yeah. people in Cleveland need to step back and look at this squad because this is not a, a higher level of role players around LeBron James. This, is, this team is, is stacked. This team is absolutely stacked. And I think that when you when you look around the, the rest of the NBA, as I've been doing, I've been watching a lot of games, a lot of the late night West Coast games, uh, multiple games every day, checking out all the other teams around the league. A, the Cavs' talent has truly, has truly separated them from more than three quarters of this league. I do believe that the NBA is a lot of haves and have-nots as it is. Uh, there's a few good teams and then everybody else. 
But uh, no, that's more evident to me this season than usual. The Cavs level, this is not just, like I said, a, a team of good players to surround LeBron with for their role. This is a team that if LeBron James was not on this basketball team, this would still be a team capable of winning the Eastern Conference. Now, that is what it is because I think there's about three good teams in the East. But watching even the West in these games that I've seen, I didn't I I was very low key before the season. I said I thought the Cavs would win about 60 games this year. Watching not just the Cavs, but watching all of the other teams. I've seen every team, I think I've seen every team play at least once or pretty close to it. The Cavs very really have a shot at winning 70 plus games this year because they have there there's a gap between the Cavs and 3 quarters of the league as far as talent. This team is going to be scary good at the end of the day even if uh even if they are flipping the switch on and off. What do you think about that? I you, you're going to you're going to you're going to hang up on me. We won't have to worry about the second half of our conversation because while I I agree with a lot of what you just said um and I do think they are very talented and very deep. Um I think there are going to be some serious stretches throughout this season where I don't want to say I don't I don't know what what the word is I don't want to say tanking they're not going to tank but where winning is not going to be the number one goal where maintaining health is going to be the number one goal um I honestly, Jerry, I don't think they're going to win sixty games. I, I think Oof. they'll be in the fifties, and I really? won't be surprised if they're in, if they're in the mid fifties. I think they're see, as talented think... as what you say. I just don't see the need to win those extra ten, fifteen games. And and in all reality, if if you can win seventy Eastern Conference games, or you can win fifty five Eastern Conference games, and you get to the same place far as I'm concerned, I'd rather spread those 15 games around to uh, LeBron and, you know, maybe Kyrie or Love in the second half of the year and make sure that everybody's healthy going into the playoffs. And, and I think you'll see a lot of that happen. I, You know, I, I'm convinced that there's going to be a LeBron sabbatical. I think we're going to grow to accept in the next couple of years a a LeBron, oh, we're going to call it like the LeBron birthday bash because his birthday is December 30th. Right, right. And I we feel like we're not going to see a lot of January games out of him. See, Mike, let me jump in, man. Let me jump because I'm with you, but I'm going to a different level than that. First off, I think that Kevin Love is going to win the MVP this season if he is able to stay healthy. I said it before. And you've had a lot of time off with like internet breakdowns and stuff. What have you been doing with your free time? That you've got the Cavs winning seventy games. Kevin Love's going to be the MVP while no, Steph Curry is I, dropping forty five a night. I did not finish. I said I think that if he stays healthy, he's going to be the 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 number one candidate coming out of the Cavs. Obviously, Steph Curry uh, has already won the award. If he if he can continue what he's doing, yeah, I hope they he's got gonna, a two for one he, on that trophy. He's going to win. He's going to win. He's going to win the most improved. And I was joking with somebody about that. I said, bro, I said, let's just, I'm just saying, if the MVP scores 10 points a game more than he did the year before and, and adds defense to his game even more, can he be most improved and MVP times too? I think he can. But anyways, uh, uh, no, I, I think that Kevin Love uh, is going to emerge as the MVP. I know, I know that obviously it all circles around 23, but, but it, it really is going to – Kevin Love's game is going to emerge. You can see not just the way the Cavs are focusing him, but he's playing at a higher level. But, bro, I'm, I'm talking about – I was conservative when I said 60-61 wins, and that's on the LeBron maintenance program. I had the Cavs giving LeBron a dozen games off this year, averaging 35 minutes a game. I literally think that the Cavaliers can rotate their their three-star players and give them each a game off every couple of games throughout the second half of the season. I still think that the Cavs are going to flirt 
between 60 and 70 wins without all of that stuff because Mo Williams is going to be your point guard on your second unit, and he is playing at a higher level than I think anybody's seen Mo Williams. This is not the same Mo Williams that played here four years ago, that played in Utah at the beginning of his career. That is a man in the Mo Williams jersey now. His ball handling is better. His decision-making, he is confident in himself. I'm telling you, Mo Williams, to me, is one of the most uh, pleasant surprises surprises here early on and he is going to bump down to the second unit there i mean the Cavs' second unit is going to be deep enough to win most nights against the eastern conference even teams that have better starting units and that's why i think that we're underestimating the value of a win in today's nba i'm not saying that the Cavs are the greatest team ever they're going to flirt with that number but they're going to flirt with that number because the gap between the haves and the have nots is so big and the Cavs are truly on the have side of that that i think that even taking games off Given those guys time off, they're deep enough now. They're still going to accidentally win a ton of games that they they may normally not have because they're just deep enough. That, like I said, when when your second unit, you know, you give Kyrie a night off, you're you're starting Mo Williams now. You know what I mean? As we're seeing at the beginning of the season, Richard Jefferson, not the greatest, but showing that he's definitely better than Marion was last year, and he can step in and fill in adequately one night every ten days for LeBron as a starter if need be. So I think that the depth and the gap between the good and the bad teams in the NBA is why I say that. Not just going Cavs crazy. I just think they're accidentally going to fall into a bunch of wins because of their talent level. As a season ticket holder, I hope you're right because uh, if they win 70 games, I might not go to a game all year and see a loss. And I hate paying <laughs> for losses. So so I, I still can't see them winning that many games. But, uh, I, you know. I mean, I, here's why. Let me I ask mean, you. As a, I as a Cleveland fan, I... I have a hard time trying to walk Mike. around going, oh, we don't need wins. So, hey, Mike, sounds look good around to me. the east. Sign me up. Let's not even talk about the West. You you follow hoops, man. Look around the sure. East and tell tell me seriously who oh, the are the best team good in the East teams. by leaps and bounds. Come on. And- but I mean, you play most of your no, games. I agree. You you play two thirds of your games against those teams. So what I'm saying is, even if you're not starting LeBron every day, you're not starting Kevin Love every third game or Mo Williams or whatever the rotation is for the veteran. I had actually come up with a veteran maintenance program where I figured for the second half of the season, literally one player could sit out per game all the way through the second half. That way everybody misses a good five or six down the stretch, and they're all uh, more like the you know, 70, 75 game marker for the season, assuming that they, they played all season, the ones that did. And, uh, you know, the veteran maintenance program. But even then, I'm looking across these teams in the East that they're going to be playing in March and April, and I'm going, man, even if you're not trying to win, how are – how are the New York Knicks? How are this team, that team, this team going to beat the team, the second unit of the Cavs, you know? And that's what I mean. It's not that I'm sitting here trying to exalt the Cavs as much as I think, man, there's a lot of bad or mediocre or just eh teams around the NBA from what I've seen in the first few weeks of the season. Yeah, I no, I, I agree with all of that. And I that was one of the things I said even the first week. I I split tickets with a, with a buddy and I – I text them. I was at the home opener, and I knew the schedule that they had coming. And I said, you know, the Cavs should be able to clinch the East by about Thanksgiving. You because, know, <laughs> because I said, you know, after after one week, if the Bulls and the Heat are the are the two best teams in the East, other than the Cavs, like you know, raise raise the banner. I'll, I'll give you a scenario that that I wake up in the middle of the night in in a sweat thinking about how terrible, about how bad it would be and, and how many fans would probably begin to freak out if it happens. But um, how about the idea that Carmelo Anthony gets traded to the Miami Heat at some point during this season? You know, I've heard I've heard a couple of rumors about different things. What do you think would be the likelihood of something like that? I mean, because I, I said before the season, 
when people were like, oh, who's going to, who's the, the top teams in the East? I had Miami there with the Cavs. I said, man, you guys are sleeping on Miami. I said, in all honesty, with Chris Bosch, that really changed their season last year, him going down. If Wade's able to, you know, do his thing and get some time off, but but do his thing. I like Dragic, uh, Bosch. I, I like Hassan Whiteside, I think, is just emerging into a, a beast in the, in the middle there for them. I thought that them and Chicago, that's your two teams that are your best along with the Cavs. Yeah, I think you know I'm I'm not saying that that I think the Cavs would lose, but I think if uh, you put Carmelo on that Miami Heat team, that's a uh, that's that's a series. That's that's one we're going to talk about. That's not going to be a four or five game exercise on the way to the next round when that would happen. I that think would they make made a nervous. mistake myself trading off Chalmers, to be honest with you. I know that they've been trying to, you know, theoretically the rumors are they've been trying to move Chalmers forever, but uh, I like that kid, and I think that that's going to help Memphis. Actually, it's so funny. About two days before that trade, I was talking to my son, and I said, man, if I was Memphis, they're such a good team, and they're struggling. I said, I heard that uh, uh, that he uh, Chalmers is on the trade block down there in Miami. I said, man, if I was them, I would maybe try to make a trade there and try to perhaps bring Mario Chalmers. Two days later, they made that no. uh, that little trade there and well, they brought him in. That's clear. That's clearing cap space. I think the I think the Grizzlies are good, man. I do. I think that I'm. I think they're the team that surprised me the most with their early season struggles. I think would be the Grizzlies because that's a good squad. And then the Cavs went up there and just manhandled them. And then they got rolled in three of their next four games. It seemed like the Cavs kind of sent them on a on a stumble there at the start of the season. Yeah, Memphis is a team that I really liked last year, and I, I've, I've been surprised that have struggled early. Other team that has struggled early that I really thought would kind of make a leap. I know this is maybe a little bit of a popular pick to to make a leap, but I'm I'm stunned that New Orleans has just come out and and just flopped on their face, really. But uh, I agree. I agree. I like that squad. It, I thought they were going to do some things this year because I love Anthony Davis. Right, and and I thought, you know, maybe with Alvin Gentry, he's a little bit more of a defensive-minded coach, and, um, you know, they, I, I felt like we, you would see Anthony Davis, you know, become a 25-point scorer and, and, and a beast defensively, and you play defense around him. Um, you know, it's kind of one of those where he becomes the quarterback of the defense, and, and you can have your guards maybe be a little bit more of a, ball hawkers and and be a little bit more aggressive knowing that you have him behind you in the paint um you know and then that kind of predicates to to the offensive side but yeah i'm I'm really surprised to see them struggle really on both ends of the ball and to get anything going um i mean it's it's a long ways to go but i guess to me in the early going a guy like alvin gentry who's you know their new head coach now he was a hot pick and a guy that people talk yeah. about in the spring, you know, maybe just because you sit on the bench next to Steph Curry and you're part of the Golden State Warriors doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, you've got all the answers. He's still got, it looks to me like a lot of Detroit Pistons in him from his time there too. Yeah, absolutely. Cavaliers, we'll talk some more about them on Monday. They've got the uh, Knicks here tonight. Another look at uh Chris Tapp Porzingis and, and Carmelo Anthony and those guys, and, and we'll talk some more about that. I want to, before I go, I know we've got like 10 minutes here with you, Mike. Let's switch back. I know we were starting off talking baseball. Let's talk a little bit about the Indians here, and uh, the offseason has begun. Where are you at right now as far as what you've heard, perhaps, that the Indians' uh, early early uh, offseason, I don't want to say targets because that's too am- ambitious of a word, but uh, the early offseason plan here for the Tribe. <laughs> Where I'm at with the Indians, I'm in like a Facebook relationship that just says it's, it's complicated. complicated. That's, <laughs> that's where I'm at with the Indians. We we don't we go through long stretches where we don't speak, um, you know. And um, I, I think I think especially with the Michael Brantley injury, they have no choice but to go out and get another outfielder. And I think I think center field was a priority before. I, and I don't think it changes that with with the loss of Brantley. They 
they have guys who can play left field. They don't necessarily have a lot of guys who can play center. Um, I think what what's interesting to me, I think their their two biggest areas of need are are center field and third base. Um, neither of those are easy positions to fill. I mean, just you know, don't don't take contracts or anything else into account. Just just go make a list of good center fielders in baseball and you know the the pickings get slim once you get past the all-stars pretty quick and the same can be true at third base and um i think they're going to have a more difficult time than what you might think filling those holes um it's my hope that they avoid signing that six million dollar man that i always talk about they don't need um you know david gallucci 6.0 6.0 or David Murphy 2.0. Um, they don't. They don't need those guys. I'd rather see them play, play a young player from from their system, um, or or sign someone at at near league minimum until a young player is ready. Um, then then commit a couple years to a to a guy somewhere in the three to eight million dollar range. But I think center field and third base are the two obvious and biggest needs and. Um, I think the biggest question is how are you going to get there? Um, to me, um, if you're if you're trading a starting pitcher to get one of those guys, you're, in my opinion, you're not getting better. Um, we we know what we know what the the guys are that would fill in the replacements. Okay, if you if you're trading Danny Salazar, Carlos Carrasco, and you're replacing them in your rotation with with Josh Tomlin, we you know. We we rode that train before. Um, I, I've seen that. I've seen that too many times. I know how it's going to go. It'll go well for a month, and it won't go so well after that. Um, I mean, those are guys that you just can't you just can't expect to get thirty quality starts out of in a year. And and I think giving up those guys in Salazar and Carrasco are a mistake. And so I mean, you have to ask yourself, how are you going to obtain those guys? And you know, to me, if you're if you're trading from your starting rotation, I think that's a bad move. Um, but but um, if not to trade from there, then how do you acquire those guys? Um, there are other ways, but they're not necessarily the Indian way. Um, you know, I don't I don't know that they're going to go out and spend a dump truckload of money on someone. To be honest. I'm not sure that there's a, a long list of quality free agent center fielders or third basemen to dump money on, even if they have it to give. Um, and, and the other route would be to, to trade from your minor league system to acquire, you know, players at the big league level. And that's not the Indian way either. So no, I, I think it's I think it's a big you know that's kind of where I go back to you know my relationship with the Indians is it's complicated um, because I think the only thing that would be worse would be if they just do nothing um, I don't I don't know nothing nothing's going to change look if if they do nothing then you know fast forward to March and you and I are going to have a conversation. You're going to be optimistic, and you're going to tell me five guys that if they all play <laughs> better, you know, the Indians will be in it. And Shut I'm up. going to tell you that that didn't work in 2014, and it didn't work in 2015, and it's not going to work in 2016. And as much as you don't want to admit it out loud, you know that that's the case, and, and you know that that's true. And so they have to do something. I, I'm really interested to see how how and what it is that they're going to do i think the i i think the worst answer is to do nothing i agree and and the whole trading man i grew up in that and uh you know i've got a whole shelf here full of books about I just, history. yeah i just that, feel like they're dancing with taking you know one one finger right. off the dam to plug another leak and they're right. just about to get hit in the face with water from a I different mean, angle that. that's all my dad saying, you know, every time they get the pitching, they trade it for hitting, and then they don't have the hitting, and they trade it for pitching, and and it was a never ending yeah. cycle, and and it seems like that's exactly where we're yeah. at again, and and really the feedback that I get on social media, it's just it's a beaten drum 
every single response says the same thing. That's stupid. Keep what you've got. Spend a few dollars. Get the one or two players that you need to help tie this stupid thing together and stop jerking the fans around. And I think that that's the place where so many people are at right now. You can talk about money and budgets and nickel and dime, and, and the people in Cleveland understand that. They've been beaten in the head with it that they don't even argue that anymore. But they're at the point where they know that this is the point where even the teams that are on the plan, the teams that are on the budget know this is where you do it or you get off the pot. You know, you make something yeah. happen or you start all over again and you just keep keep doing this over and over and over. I wrote a story that's, that's on Do the Tribal Win last night a couple weeks ago and um, I'd love to tell you that I even remember the exact title of the headline, but it was a it was a numbers look at, at the Indians and how they compare to playoff teams. And very quickly, what came out of it, out of studying all 88 playoff teams of the last decade, the one thing that they have that is of playoff quality is their starting rotation. And a lot of things that they tell us otherwise are still subpar. Their core is not as strong as the average playoff team's core if you take your 10 best players. It's not. It hasn't been. It hasn't been in the last three years. Um, they need to improve upon their core players. Um, also, they're not as young as we like to pretend that they are. Michael Brantley, Carlos Santana, Jason Kipnis, Corey Kluber. These guys are in the primes of their career. I, I mean... They're not developing, okay? Their numbers are – that's that's what their career is going to be. They're in their peak right now, and, and to me that means a couple things. One, it is unfair to expect them to play better. And two, you need to get some help around them because yeah. their, their twilight is coming, whether you want to accept it or believe it. Um, Michael Bourne is no better a situation. Go look Michael Bourne's numbers up from the year before he signed with the Indians. There's a reason why people were all excited. He was 29, 30 years old, and he was coming off a great year. Um, I'm not predicting doom and gloom for the Indians, but, I mean, I think there's reason to be concerned that some of these guys, you know, they're at their peak. There's only one way to go down. There's only one way to go from the peak, Jerry, and, and so they better get them some help, and they better get them some help fast. Otherwise, you know, we're going to spend five, six years building and waiting for guys to peak, and it's going to be over before it starts. You are absolutely right. Board and Swisher, I hear Atlanta is trying to trying to move a couple of guys by those names, man. Good luck, guys. It's not as Yeah, good easy. luck. It took the Indians about a year and a half. <laughs> and we had to find so you guys. I don't know guys. where they're going to find one. I just saw that the other day, and somebody on my, on my Facebook page commented, uh, no back season. I'm like, yes, absolutely. We're not going back on that one. You already bought them. Brantley, real quick, as as I know you've got to go, uh, I think caught some people by surprise because the thought was that he wasn't going to need surgery. Uh, Indians, I think, maybe even caught by surprise. They knew it was a possibility, but obviously if they thought it was a, go- a foregone conclusion, they would have jumped on it earlier than they did. Now it's going to drag into the beginning of next season, which is fine if you're talking about a couple of weeks. But what are you hearing? Everything should... Uh, uh, should everything be hunky dory with the with the rehab here, or is this something that we'll need to look at when uh, when Michael Brantley starts to return next year? I think it's reason to be concerned. I mean, as a baseball player, you use your shoulder for a lot of things. That's oh, yeah. I mean, that's that's reason to be concerned. And and again, tongue in cheek, but but also there's some truth to it. You know, that'll be the Indians' newest excuse come April and May when they get off to another slow start. <laughs> it will be. Just plug it in. You can hear it now, man. That's going to be what they're saying. It's because we didn't have Michael Brandt. I, I was I was thinking about that. I'm like, man, well, yeah, and they're always going to start slow anyway, so at least now they've right. got, uh, got that built in. We'll see, though, man. I mean, obviously, hey, that's got to be a priority. We can't even joke about that, Mike. I mean, as you say, how long can we say it's still they've early? They've got to get obviously. off to a good start. Yeah, that's have another to. topic have for to. another day. But, and that's but what we'll get into. To. Yes, I want to talk some more about that when you join me here next week and talk a little bit about Mark Shapiro's start in Toronto. What rings did he bring across the border is what they're asking. Yeah, uh, I, I, that's a great topic for, for next week. I've got some friends in Canada. They want some, they want some backseats there. 
<laughs> we'll talk about that. We'll talk some more Cavs. We'll talk Indians, some hot stove as it started. Hey, free agents, trades have started. It may have crept up on you guys, but the off season has begun for baseball, man. Sounds good, my man. I'll talk to you later. You got it. Mike Brandenburg, make sure you guys check him out. Did the tribe win last night dot com. Always some good stuff. And he's with us here every week on the show. We're gonna go ahead and Take a break, final break of the show. We'll get BJ Riddell in on the conversation when we come back. You know when BJ joins us, it's time for fantasy football for winners as he looks through, gives you some sleepers and some guys that perhaps the other guys may not be looking at. Tips and, and some tidbits to help you win your league here. We're getting close to, to uh, cutting time. It's, it's money time in a lot of leagues. I know most of mine have within – what, three to five weeks left before the playoffs start? So this is very important stuff for many people here. We'll talk to B.J. Riddell about some fantasy football for winners. We'll get you set for the weekend and so much more when we come back. Don't go anywhere. Plenty of sports fix still to come, baby. This I know. She told me don't worry about it. She told me don't worry. And now, a very special announcement from the Sports Fix. Black bears weigh between two and 500 pounds. Brown bears weigh between 300 and over 1,000 pounds. Black bears run away from you. Brown bears run at you. When attacked by a bear, simply lie still on the ground and cover your face and head with your hands. When the bear is finished batting you around and mauling you, contact the U.S. Forest Service. And that was a message from the Sports Fix. <laughs> The Sports Fix. We'll be right back. Football season is party season at Harry Buffalo North Olmstead, And no matter who you root for, everyone wins at Harry Buffalo. Every Saturday is Coors Light College Football Saturday with $6 pitchers, pitchers four, four bottles, bottles for 10, 10 bucks, bucks, and, and the, the Buckeyes, Buckeyes in full HD. HD. Oh, hey. Every Sunday, all the Browns action with, with Bud, Bud Light beer, beer specials and $10, and $10 Hair of the, the Dog, dog pictures. Hey, baby, let's go out there like a bunch of crazy dogs and have some fun. Plus, every Monday night, catch the Monday night football action with some of your favorite Browns players. Football season is most definitely party season, and your headquarters is Harry Buffalo North Olmstead all winter long. Harry, Harry Buffalo, Buffalo, join the herd. Sports Fix listeners, like us on Facebook today. Facebook.com slash The Sports Fix. Fantasy sports lovers, you put so much time, hard work, and effort into playing week to week that it quickly stops being a fantasy and starts getting real. Real time spent making real decisions, creating real victory. I'm the greatest man in the world! And when the smoke clears, you want to show off those victories with a real prize. I mean, a really real prize. Yeah. Nobody, Nobody does, does that, that like, like Fantasy, Fantasy Jocks. Jocks. The crew over at Fantasy Jocks have beautiful, high-quality, and heavy-duty championship belts, rings, trophies, and so much more for all your fantasy sports needs. The trophy's 12 feet high, and it is glorious! Football, baseball, hoops, you name it, they have it. Plus, they have awesome draft kits and party supplies to make all your preseason activities the envy of everyone. If your league needs a ring, belt, or trophy, or you want to upgrade what you already have, there's literally only one place to go. If you're going to be a fantasy jock, do it right. It's mine. The most magnificent belt ever created. And it's mine. With America's fantasy sports superstore, fantasyjocks.com. In baseball, miracles can happen when a team works together. Two out, bottom of the ninth, down to their last strike. The same is true in the fight against cancer. That's why MLB has teamed up with Stand Up to Cancer. Because we believe that when we all stand up together, 41,000 on their feet, we can make cancer history. Now everybody's standing. What a buzz in this building. This is beyond a dream. Stand up with MLB at StandUpToCancer.org. This is head coach Gary Waters at Cleveland State, and you're listening to The Sports Fix.
You guys ready for the weekend or what? I'm fired up. Tons of things to get into. I'll talk to you more about that in a minute. Welcome back to the Sports Fix. J-Rock back with you here. You heard my man Coach Water They're getting their season started this weekend. They're part of the Coaches Against Cancer doubleheader coming up from Akron. It'll be Akron and Cleveland State. I think they're the second team in that doubleheader that's coming up here this weekend. But uh, the Viking season begins. Coach Waters, we talked to him was about two weeks ago here on the show and got a chance to catch up with him. It's going to be an interesting season. And it's going to be an up-and-down season for sure. A learning season for the Vikings. as That's a young squad over there. We talked about the toll that, that they obviously took losing Grady and Trey Lewis and Bryn Forbes the year before. Three fifth-year senior transfers that came out and uh, you know guys that had already graduated but had basketball eligibility left and a couple of the big schools came in and swooped those guys up. Louisville and Wichita State and Michigan State respectively for those three teams or those three players and uh, it really left some holes here. You've got some guys that are getting their opportunities to step up. Opportunity is the key word, and Coach Waters has been coaching them up. And the Vikes and the Akron Zips, 9 p.m. tip-off. It'll be the Coaches versus Cancer doubleheader at Kent State. Kent is the host squad. They have the first game. They're taking on the Penguins of Youngstown State. And then the second game is the Vikings and Akron. It is a neutral site game. It's only the First time the Vikes have had a neutral site opener since all the way back in the 02-03 season. Of course, last year, Vikings went 19-5 and on the season, 11-5 and in the Horizon League. They played in the Basketball Insider Tournament, second straight year they were. Akron won the last meeting between these squads, 73-61. to That was a couple years back on CSU's home turf, and they've won the last two in this series, as well as honing, owning the series overall, 36-31. Akron with a five victory lead in that one as the next matchup is this weekend. Vikings, one of the youngest teams in the nation this year. Their roster features just 16 seasons of college basketball experience. One senior, that's Vinny Zolo. He's the leader of the squad here. There's only two players on the Vikes entire roster who started last year, Andre Yates and Zolo. And Zolo only had five. Yates is really the guy. 22 starts last year. 143 lost starts between the collection of graduation and or student transfer. And last year, it was the opposite. Remember, the Vikes last year had a Horizon League best 118 starters returning uh, when you look at the game started the previous season. This year, the complete opposite. And that's really the work that Coach has uh, cut out for him. And he, I know he thrives on it. We talked a few weeks ago here on the show. He's up for it. And uh, it'll be a lot of fun to watch as it starts off. Coach Waters is six and three in season openers, best record in home op- or in season openers for any coach in Vikings history. And the Vikings had won four straight season openers under Coach Waters until last year uh, when they dropped the opener. You know, one thing that I didn't even realize when I was talking to Coach Waters, and I, shame on me, we talked so much about Jabri Blunt, the, which I'm really excited to see him, Mel Blount's son, the of course Pittsburgh Steelers legendary. Uh, player there, Hall of Famer from the NFL, uh, 14 seasons with the Steelers, Mel Blount, his son Jabri playing for the Vikings this year after coming out of Akron, St. Vincent, St. Mary. He led that squad to a 26-1 and record last year, and uh, Jabri went 16-11 and for the season, but I didn't even realize that Jerron Rodgers is also the son of a professional athlete. He's another player. He's a freshman starting out with the Vikings this year. He's the son of Carlos Rogers, who played for the Sonics and the Denver Nuggets. Though. Those of you that are mid '90s uh, basketball guys, you'll remember that name from the uh, from those squads. He was the 11th pick in the '94 NBA draft by the SuperSonics back in the. Uh, was that uh, was Sean Kemp already traded to the Cavs? May have been, but it was in that area, the Gary Payton era of the. Uh, of the Sonics. Carlos Rogers played for them. Then, as I said, played for the Nuggets. Uh, he was a top 10 finalist for Mr. Basketball in Michigan. But that's uh, very rare that you get two second generation legendary type uh, guy. Well, you know, obviously, uh, Mel Blount's a little different level than Carlos Rogers, but still, that's some good stuff. We'll see what the Vikings can do here as they kick things off, kick off the 10th season of Gary Waters as the head coach of the Cleveland State Vikings. He's the third longest tenured 
coach in program history. He's won 347 games in his career, 176 of those coming for the Cleveland State Vikings. All right, guys, B.J. Riddell joining me on the hotline now. Fantasy football for winners. Let's talk about some pigskin. But before we get into Week 10, matter of fact, before we get into anything, B.J., how you doing, my friend? Good, Jerry. How are you? I'm good. Sorry to keep you uh, keep you waiting there for a minute. You okay. me just as I got started, I'm like, well, doggone it. I, I already started. Might as well finish talking about the Vikes here. But uh, <laughs> before we talk about who you sit, who you start, uh, one of the big stories of the week that I haven't even touched here on the show, I was saving it for you, Attorney General in New York throws down yeah. the gauntlet against DraftKings and FanDuel and Daily Fantasy. Actually, I found out about it the other day. I, I logged on to my DraftKings app, and they had a big ban ad at the top of the app that says stop New York and I said what's this about and then that was when the news had broke of what they did uh, what are your thoughts first off I mean obviously New York feels that it is a, a game of chance not a game of skill uh, DraftKings answers back and says hey uh, which I found this statistic actually quite interesting for all the, the commercials that talk about the millions and billions of dollars that people win on those uh, DraftKings had an interesting stat from their fantasy baseball season this year that shows showed that um, only 1.9% of the fantasy baseball players won over 90% of the money that was won. Mm. That is amazing when you realize that only yeah. 2% of the players won 90% of the money that was available to be won in the first half of the baseball season this year. So does yeah. that show that it's a game of skill, or does that show that maybe there's somebody putting their finger on the scales? Because I have a question. And I want to start it with you. And this isn't about this story per se, but it's something that's really been bugging me for the last couple of weeks. Have you noticed that FanDuel is now running a commercial? And I haven't seen this on DraftKings. I've only seen this offered by FanDuel. Guaranteeing anybody who deposits on their site that you will cash in your first game played or they'll give you your deposit back up to, you know, whatever the, the cap is, $15, whatever it is. But part of me wonders, how is that possible? Because, and I, I look back to when I signed up, registered for my DraftKings account. This is, maybe this is just a coincidence, but the very first tournament that I played when I registered for DraftKings, I cashed. Also, the very first tournament that I played after I deposited on DraftKings, I also cashed in that one. And I also cashed in the two free tournaments that DraftKings gave me for each of those actions. Yet, outside of those four, my cash percentage is incredibly minuscule. And I go, how is that not coincidental that at, those, at those key moments when I'm first starting? that I win and then I don't. Yeah. And then you've got a commercial that guarantees that people are going to win first time out. That has really got my antenna raised beyond attorney generals at some suspicion all around. Take me from there, brother. Yeah. Well, there's, uh, you've covered a lot of ground there. So let me, uh, I'll weigh in on a few things and they're all, you know, based on, uh, you know, hypotheticals and I'm not going to get into the, I'm not going to raise my antenna necessarily, but um, a few things. One is uh, you never know if some people there who are winning are putting in 500 bets. And out of those 500, they're increasing their odds by 500 that they're going to win. Um, you know, if you compete against 20,000 people and you put in 500 bets because you happen to be wealthy enough that you can bet $500 or $1,000 with a $2 bet, Knowing that you've got now, you know, 20,000 divided by 500, uh, you know, uh, my math's going to be off, but a one in 40 chance of winning the jackpot and maybe a one in 10 chance of basically recu recouping their money. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's what some people do. Uh, I've been on, I've, I've, you know, played those as I've mentioned before. I won one this past summer and, uh, you know, I've about 18,000 people. And uh, what I notice is when you sign up, you see, you can see everyone else who signed up, and you can see dozens and dozens and dozens of plays that a certain person is making on that game, where you know that they're just tweaking their lineup here or there. If this, then that. Let's have, let's factor in. What if this is a blowout game? Let's start the backup running back just in case they get a lot of fourth quarter run and maybe get a cheap score and they get a cheap great great running back. They're, they've got all these permutations all mapped out, 
So for you and me, you know, I don't, I don't play uh, that many. I'll sometimes no. do two or no. three in yeah. a contest just to, you know, decide, well, if I me really too. mess up on yeah. one, I want to have another yeah. one in my back pocket. But uh, that's one factor to consider. There are some people who have money up front, they can burn, and they feel like if they have a one in whatever, six chance of getting their money back playing 500 times, they'll do it because enough times over and over again, they'll, they'll make a small profit. Makes uh, and then you factor in the fact that some of these contests are only against about 1,000 people, especially when you do, and some, some of your listeners might know what I'm talking about, if it's an hour before kickoff, Sometimes they'll throw in, especially with non-football games, baseball, hockey, basketball, they'll throw in these very quick thousand people, yeah. two dollars a piece. Winner gets three hundred bucks. That's and down my the crack line. rock right there. I'm not gonna lie. That's the one that gets me. I end up getting stuck in those daily basketballs. And brother, yeah. if you, you think fantasy football is hard, daily fantasy basketball may be the most impossible thing i've ever attempted in my life you always it get is, seven yeah. out of eight right and then one of them either doesn't play or gets hurt in the first quarter or has That's a right. bad night and you're like how how do these people win because i come so close every time i basketball has burned me more than any other uh, that i've done but i'll tell you a couple of weeks ago and i shared my wife i texted my wife a screenshot of it so i was so excited about it but uh, i tied for third uh, in a contest nice. out of about 27,000 people. But it was a 25-way tie for third because all of us had, you know, the exact same lineup. Same lineup, so, yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's, and, and that's because the people who won, the, the person who won and the person who came in second picked a backup center. Uh, it was Marcus Gasol's backup, uh, journeyman Brendan Wright. Uh, who no one took. It was 0.1% yeah, yeah, like of the people 50, in the whole thing. It was point night that and, night or something. Yeah. I, I yeah. And Marcus yeah. all got knocked out with like a head injury in the first in half. The first quarter. Light comes he, in I had him that first night. Quarter. Yeah. That's yeah. what you remember. <laughs> and so the two people who took a chance and said, you know what, out of the, let's say, 50, you know, bets that I'm going to do, who knows? Maybe they just did one bet. But let's just, let's just put my money on Brendan Wright. And if they're right, and they're right on everything else, they're going to win because yep. no one else has right. And they're using all that leverage of a cheap center to then, you know, bolster every other position. So Brother. it's, there's, there's systems in place for people who are willing to invest more to win more. It's really just like life. I, I don't want to get, uh, you know, uh, talk about capitalism on your show, but it's people who have more money, uh, have the, have the resources to make more money. You know, if I have a hundred thousand right. dollars that I can do anything with, I can put it in an interest bearing account and make, you know, make one, two thousand dollars, you know, extra each year without doing anything with it. Someone who has a hundred dollars to spare because they're living paycheck to paycheck can't do that. The same thing with FanDuel and DraftKings. Those with a lot of money have more resources to, to take more risks and to get bigger pots than those of us who play one, two or three times each night. Well, really, the odds are against us. And you know what? Let's circle that back around to where we started with this. What are your thoughts on New York? And there was an issue with Vegas a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and now, and it really started with that story that broke about how the, the FanDuel guy made a truckload of money by betting on DraftKings. And that really yeah. raised the antenna of law enforcement and attorney generals. Now, New York throwing the gauntlet down first and trying to ban this. First off, do you think they're going to be able to hold this down, or what are your thoughts on the game of chance versus game of skill? Now, since I play every day, not like I'm a degenerate gambler, but it's definitely a game of skill and <laughs> chance because I think I know what I'm talking about, and yet I still get chanced out every day, and so I don't know. But what are yeah. your thoughts on this, and are the governments, are, are, are every state's government going to start getting their hands in here? Because there's obviously not only issues of fairness – issues i relate this a lot to um i don't know about you but i used to play a lot again i'm not a degenerate gambler but i used to like online poker uh, there was no casino yeah, yeah. in cleveland we didn't have casinos up until a few years ago so you know unless you wanted to drive out of town i love playing some texas hold'em and 
it was it what there were a ton of legal sites and then Bodog and all of them got shut down by the government what about uh, about seven yeah. eight years ago and people lost the, you know got their money frozen but wh- I understood why because I thought a lot of those sites were open to be cheating and 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 screwing people yeah, out of their you money because there was if no you're, if you're in a digital if you're doing a digital yeah. Texas Hold'em you have no right. idea if there's an algorithm in that in that yes system. and. And it so said, the okay, was this person's made too much money. I'm going yeah. to, you know, I had let's give them an eighth of spades right here. You know, people and People saying whatever. the government shouldn't be involved. I'm like, the hell with that, because there, I guarantee you that some of these sites are literally just stealing people's money, and right. people have no clue. So I look at it kind of under that. These governments want to know your algorithms. They want to know your systems. They want to know that it's fair, that it's that everything is generated, whatever for whatever the system is or whatever. And they want the right. cut too. They want their percentages. The states are going, Hey, you guys are betting in our states, even though it's digital. Yeah. How do we get a cut? So how do you see this all shaking out? <laughs> I see. Well, I, you know, if, if New York State, this is just my armchair, you know, response to it yeah, as a citizen. Yeah. If I and I used to live in New York, I was born and raised in New York City. If if my state had decided to shut something down, I would want to know that they have evidence that what they're doing is illegal, not just the act, because the act itself, I, I in my belief, is not in any way illegal. It is a skill base. I was asked this on a Wichita TV station a year ago. I was interviewed. Because Kansas uh, rep- uh, state representatives were introducing legislation to ban fantasy sports uh, in Kansas, and so it, you know you have certain states that that are, are more interested in this uh, right now. And New York obviously is one of them. It's the Attorney General, and I would say, uh, you know, essentially demonstrate that this is, that what they're doing is illegal. If there's shady stuff happening within the organization. If there's phone tapping being done because there's a certain percent sense, certain evidence that something illegal might be happening, or, or a disgruntled employee is acting as a whistleblower, something to that effect, then you have something. But just to wipe it out and to say no, you know, after this has been going on for years, uh, in various capacities. I mean, has the attorney general ever played in a March Madness pool before? Uh, has you know, has any attorney general's family members ever done that? Not to drag them into it. But the point is, there is a selective response to gambling, uh, uh, in my experience, where people are willing to do things behind closed doors, but once it's publicized, people feel very antsy about it. And I would suggest there needs to be a, a kind of a, a reevaluation across the country uh, of what is acceptable, and if it's acceptable privately, it should be acceptable publicly. Now, the other issue facing the, especially the daily fantasy sports leagues right now, FanDuel's dealing with the uh, with the lawsuit uh, issues now is, and I knew it was only a matter of time before this. I still wonder how they, they get away with using the, the colleges the way they do. But the players union, we saw Pierre Garçon and those guys have stepped yeah. up and said, hey, you're using our names. Pierre Garçon, I think he said in the half hour infomercial, his name was listed 33 times, either spoken or on the screen. And uh, obviously, these guys are not being, you know, compensated. It, it's along to me. I kind of equate that along the lines of the video games, and and whether you're on a Madden, you should get compensated. Same thing there. Uh, you know, even if we were betting on, you know, wide receiver number eighty-eight for this team, you know who it is. But we're actually to the point that they're using their names and in, in their pictures and who they are. But I, what is it, DraftKings? has a deal with the Players Association. So those guys are getting right, right. some type of compensation because that's what it is. I mean, basically, that's the right. players want compensated for using their names and their stats. That's right. Um, I, you know, I, I guess, again, this is uh, this is far above me. I'm no legal scholar in any sense. No, we're just um, talking. You know, obviously, a, there is a good case to be made uh, that, uh, Stan, as I understand it, Stan Duell had an opportunity to also – signed an agreement with the NFL and didn't, and DraftKings did. Um, I'm not sure if that's the case. I understand that to be the case. Uh, so if that is that, if that is the case, then yes, it is on Sam Duell to, to you know, play by the rules as, as governed by the NFL and protecting its players. Um, that said, uh, if I have a blog that I make money on, and I don't make money on my blog, but if I had a blog that I made money on, um, and I were to uh, include a photo 
uh, Pierre Garçon and caption him, uh, would I be liable? Is that some, is that illegal? And I would say, if I don't own the rights to the photo, of course it's illegal. And then I would take a step back and say, how many websites out there show photos that they don't have the permission to show? Uh, how many people, uh, what? include names of, of people, not just in reporting, uh, but in promotional type ways that they shouldn't be doing. And the fact is, it's easy to, to take on the big fish. You know, FanDuel is a big fish. They make a lot of money. So, of course, a lawsuit makes more sense. It doesn't make sense, obviously, for others who are doing the exact same thing on a much smaller scale. So, again, it comes back to, and this is all aspirational thinking, I realize. We like players that satisfy. Obviously, you do as but, well. And we certainly <laughs> don't like ones that don't Sorry satisfy us in fact. Computer just started Thank talking you. over you, man. Sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, no problem. No problem. As- <laughs> aspirationally, it's, uh, you know, that the same policy should, should apply throughout. And if there's going to be a lawsuit, if there's going to be this, this understanding that there should be no likeness of NFL players unless there's an agreement with the NFL, then let's have, uh, you know, a, a class action lawsuit against everyone who's doing it because otherwise it's essentially penalizing those who are making more money on it than others. Uh, and, and I, you know, as an, as an American, I have a problem with that because I believe there should be consistency across all levels. Oh, for sure. Now you're, we're going into a whole different b- bunch of issues, and I agree I, with you. I there. pulled out the as an American line. So that, you as know, you know that it's a, hey, you know it's make a America thing, great again. Think. Hey man, we're building <laughs> walls. We're we're making America great, man. I was joking, okay. <laughs> totally off the topic. I was joking with somebody last night. I was watching Trump do do a round of of interviews yesterday, and I looked at my buddy <laughs> and I go, "Man, he's like I thought this wall was theoretical." I go, "No, man, dude's gonna put bricks and mortar together. He wants to build the wall of Mexico, <laughs> man. He wants to build the the Trump towers across. You know, he'll 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 put a name on it. There'll be hotels across this thing and everything. I'm like, no, he physically wants to put the bricks together and build a wall, man. So that's right. funny stuff. That's right. Make America great again, man. By the way, he was. Uh, I saw him on Saturday Night Live the other night, and all it did was made me realize that I hadn't watched that show in like ten years, and it is like the most. <laughs> awful show ever now i cannot believe <laughs> the downfall of saturday night live it i swear That's i watched funny. it for 90 minutes and i laughed three times and I, those were yeah. forced those were forced not, man i think i i just wanted to make myself laugh to prove i still could after yeah, 90 minutes yeah. of watching that crap man. i go All back right. and rewatch the uh dana carvey phil hartman uh jan hooks year right you know that's uh Here's... that's when you know uh, the, the sketches were creative and uh uh, thoughtful, uh, every not season. just uh, I mean, taking the same concept and repeating it every week. But anyway, I don't even know. I don't even that. know how people think these skits are funny. I mean, I watch them, and it's not only is the the content not funny, but the people delivering them aren't either. I know that they can't all be all star cast of ten stars deep, but even the thin cast would always have three or four potential future guys. Like there's, That's I right. swear, Keenan, Keenan may be the funniest guy on the doggone show. There's nobody yeah. funny on that show anymore. Well, he's, and he's more refined because he's been doing it for 12 right. years. So he knows yeah. exactly, he, he's not under any pretense that he's going to break out and become this, you know, amazing celebrity. He stays within himself. He knows what he's good at. He Give me Ray Lewis. He delivers yeah. the lines well. Yeah. They and I think these days when you go update. to SNL, you assume that you're going you're you're one step away from hosting the Tonight Show. Whereas 25 <laughs> years ago, you know, you joined SNL and and you were looking to create an ensemble uh, that was going to be water cooler fodder, yep. you know, on on Monday morning. Uh, right. And it's it's an entirely different concept. These days They've ruined. Time. It's like they've ruined water they've ruined weekend update how can you mess up weekend update that is fish in a barrel that has always been one of the funniest segments of the show i watched it and said are yeah. you, who are these guys hosting it and why are they not funny this is ridiculous man yeah anyways yeah. hey we're talking all this let's circle back around i fantasy think i have two football. minutes to talk fantasy football so two minutes to talk <laughs> fantasy football well we drill. always say opportunity and injury man we saw a month run where you, we started with jamal charles arian foster Le'Veon bell Dion lewis bell cow backs going down across the league yeah. leaves a lot of yeah. opportunities who do you I, got spotlighted this week as, as people are getting ready for playoffs and stuff some of your guys who's gonna get hurt who's the next running back will go down that's everybody um, it seems that's 
Well, you know, I, I made a trade in my 20-team league, and I thought it would be useful to just quickly share it, not in a self-aggrandizing way, because I'm no. not sure I got the better end of the deal. But I traded. It's a 20-team league. I have Tony Romo. I've been sitting on him since week. You know, I drafted him. There's no starting QB on waivers because it's a 20-team league. So I have, I have Romo, and I have uh, Matt Castle. And I traded those two and Jeremy Langford. Uh, the guy who, who ripped off, you yeah. know, 140 yards on a score or whatever on, uh, on, sun, on Monday night, Sunday. Uh, yeah, Monday night. Uh, and I traded them for two throwaway running backs and Ben Roethlisberger. And I did it because, and people need to pay attention to that stuff as, as, and I know a lot of your listeners do, but Jeremy Langford, what he did was against the Chargers, uh, one of the worst defenses in the league. His, his, he's going up against coming up. He's got, uh, I believe Denver, he's got Green Bay, he's got yeah. uh, uh, one other tough one, the, the Rams. Uh, the schedule is not kind to him. Meanwhile, Tony Romo in weeks 15 and 16, a lot of people's fantasy the playoff, he's going up against the Bills and then the Jets, coming off major surgery. So my idea was I'm trading these two guys because I, I think their value is going to plummet uh, either sooner or later. Pat Forte is going to come back, Langford's going to be next to worth. So the idea here is cash out and get a potential top seven quarterback when healthy, if not better, uh, for the fantasy run. And I would say this is a time of year when people need to start consolidating, uh, you know, their, their, uh, you know, their players. And if you have a top 40 receiver, he's not going to help you win the title. You got, got to start thinking about, you know, trade deadline is any day now for a lot of people start packaging players, start, selling high on guys, even guys who look great. You know, I'm, I'm trying to trade stuff on Diggs. Diggs has been looking fantastic, obviously, except for last week. But if I can get in the Mari Cooper form, someone who I feel more confident in going forward uh, with a better quarterback and, and a pretty good schedule, I'm going to do it. And so this is really the time to make sure that people aren't just sitting back saying, I've got a team that can get me to the playoffs. It has to be a team that can win it all. You just mentioned quarterback and Ben Roethlisberger. He's in one of my leagues, and I don't know what to do with him. So I went and grabbed a streamer for this week. Tell me if you like it. I went with Kirk Cousins because everybody yeah. against the Saints is going to town. And I said, you know what? Cousins has already had like two, yep. four touchdown games this season anyway. So odds are he can probably match that against the Saints. Is that who you went with or, or what? Yes. that is. A, he is a great, great guy to stream this week. Uh you know, going into New England and you look at what he did, which wasn't much. He got a late TD, which he was fortunate to do, and that ended up being the difference of me winning versus losing in that 20-team league last week. But, uh, you know, Cousins is one of those guys. The running game is such a mess uh, that uh, it's, it's essentially on his arm. Uh, if the Redskins have any chance of getting to the playoffs, it's not going to happen with Alfred Morris. It apparently won't happen with Matt Jones, who can't hold on to the ball. And Chris Thompson is a one-dimensional player. Um, and, you know, he's not a true, true, you know, every down back. So I like the idea of starting a quarterback who's going to throw it 40 times uh, against an awful defense at home. Sounds good. Who else do you like this week and who don't you like on your way out? I uh, love Garrett Blunt. I uh, loved him last week. Some guys oh, yeah. tried to trade. Get him, get him from me last week for Emmanuel Sanders. I said, yeah, enjoy you know, enjoy that 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 idea that you're going to take with Garrett Blunt, and now with Deion Lewis gone, Blunt's value skyrockets. Uh, I would not give up on uh, any Steelers uh, at all, and I would even pick up Jer- uh, Jordan Todman, the former Jacksonville Jaguar, just in case. D'Angelo Williams is 32 and a half years old. He's already got nicked up after last game. If he goes down, Jordan Todman becomes uh, one of the more interesting. Uh, handcuffed running backs that you can have, especially going into the fantasy playoffs. If you've got Ben Roethlisberger, Antonio Brown, Martavis Bryant, and company, and you're the running back of that team getting 20 carries, uh, that's, that's worth an RB2 right there. So Jordan Todman is a guy that I'm keeping an eye on uh, to see if I want to pick him up. Uh, Christine Michael, the same way, running back for the Cowboys. I mentioned him last week. I'll keep mentioning him. But I don't think Darren McFadden's going to stay healthy. And one thing I didn't realize, by the way, Darren McFadden's going against the fourth best rush defense in terms of rushing yards per carry uh, in the league. So uh, this game against Tampa Bay is not an easy game for Darren McFadden. It is quite possible that he's going to have one of those six to eight point days that uh, people you know do not want to see their number one or number two running back yet. 
My man, B.J. Riddell. Quick run through the league here. Fantasy football for winners. Anybody, of course, with questions can follow your blog. They hit you up on Twitter, at B.J. Riddell, all weekend long up until game time. And, my man, thank you, as always, for joining us. How'd you do last week? Uh, I ended up winning two and losing one. So I was happy about that. The two that I'm most focused on, I'm eight and one and seven and two. So at this point, it's just trying to consolidate. It's just like I'm talking about and make sure that I've got the best possible team because – Eight and one, seven and two. It doesn't matter if uh, if you have to play a you know a playing game and then lose in the first round. That's kind of a waste. How about you? Uh, I'm, uh, last week was awful. I went o for the entire fantasy sports world to the point that I stopped Oof. checking things halfway through. It was I've had a bad two week run, a very bad two week run because I got hit with injuries and bye weeks that were just double whammies for me. Oof. And uh, I mean, you know, it's bad when you're losing. And you have no points on your bench as well. That's when you know that it's yeah. just one of them weeks where it wasn't going to happen no matter what you did. Yeah. Because yeah, you right. had six guys on by and the two that are healthy are hurt. And now you're – Yeah, I got. I did luck into – I picked up James Starks a couple weeks ago uh, just because I needed a backup, you know, running back or something. And, and with the yeah. – by the way, what is the status? Because he, he did well last week. For people that have Starks, how is uh, – how is um, uh, uh, Lacey? Got to trade him. Got to trade him. The, the think, chance uh, of Starks being uh, the man in uh, come to fantasy playoffs is about ten percent, in my opinion. Uh, I don't think. No, the I pack, was just Packers, curious. The the next few weeks, the status of Lacey here. I mean, how is that going forward? Lacey is uh, allegedly just confused about why he's not doing well. Maybe it's because he showed up at camp supposedly ten pounds overweight. Maybe because, and more likely because, or part of it, you know, battling injuries this season. Uh, but the fact is, he's. He's expected to play this weekend, and, and okay, it's such a fluid arrangement. Um, you could see a situation where Starks gets the first, you know, three carries, goes for eight yards, and then they give Lacey the second turn, and he goes off, and that's the last to see of Starks for most of the game. Yeah. It's that no, kind of fluid just... situation. So I've been telling people, get Lacey, ditch Starks while you can still get value. I traded Starks three weeks ago after that big game he had, or two weeks ago, for Willie yeah. Sneed. And... Uh, that's what people need to be thinking about is, is don't keep a guy who is very unlikely to be the starting running back clearing away for most of the season and start fits into that category. I need a lot of help. I need to win out, man, to make the playoffs in these leagues, I'm thinking, brother. But, hey, you know what? Playoffs begin today. That's how I got to look at it, man. That's right. You, you and I will catch up. We'll catch up next week, and uh, we'll look around things, get guys ready for man, a couple weeks till the playoffs, brother. Right on. Good luck this week, Jared. You too. Have a good one, my man. BJ Riddell, Fantasy Football for Winners. Check out the blog, Fantasy Football for Winners, on Facebook. Check him out on Twitter, at BJ Riddell, all the way up until game time. You can ask him who you should start, who you should sit. Looking around the league, I'm telling you, don't sleep on uh, don't sleep on Pittsburgh Steelers players, as he said throughout the rest of the season. Here, I mean, uh, they uh, offensively. You saw what Antonio Brown did the other day. Obviously, he's not somebody that is available. But I picked up D'Angelo Williams in one of my leagues two weeks ago, and look at you know. Obviously, I wasn't sure, and that's why I didn't start him last week. I wasn't sure what he would do, but he stepped right in there and did not uh, did not miss a beat for them. And then, of course, they've got the Browns who have who have done better against the run the last two weeks. But as you know, all season long, one of the worst uh, teams out there against the run. Uh, Looking around as well, some of the matchups here this weekend. There's some good ones out there. Amari Cooper and Derek Carr against Minnesota. I kind of like them. And and they've got Crabtree as well uh, up against that Vikings defense. Uh, Baltimore's been toasted. Blake Bortles is, a, to me, a good play if you're looking, especially because he's available in a lot of leagues. Good streaming quarterback. And uh, Allen Robinson, if you can pack them two together. Baltimore is, I believe, worst or, or right up there. They're, no, New Orleans is worst against opposing quarterbacks. But Baltimore's top five as well. And as I mentioned, if you can get Kirk Cousins, if you need a starter, I think uh, he's going to look good because every team that plays the, the uh, Saints, their quarterback has had the – I think there's only one week this season that the quarterback who played the New Orleans Saints wasn't the top scoring fantasy football uh, quarterback in most leagues so keep that in mind if you can pick up quarterbacks if you need streamers going against either of those teams there there's a 
a uh, lot of possibility. Uh, if you do go with Cousins, Jordan Reed may be a good one to team him up with. Gary Barnage, I think he was down last week. I look for him to pick up. Uh, he's really the only dependable option week to week in the Browns offense. I think he'll uh, I think he'll have a good week here this week. I think it depends, obviously, who the quarterback is as well for the Browns. That'll be something to uh, keep in mind here. Um as things go on, I don't know. Let me know where you're at. I I don't know if you even want to listen to me anyway because I've had I've had some uh, some bad last two weeks. Last two weeks in the six actual legitimate uh, fantasy football games I've had, zero and six plus had a couple of bad weeks in DraftKings. So the Attorney General might as well ban me for my own good because I'm uh, I'm not doing myself any good anyway. But if you got any questions. Check with B.J. Riddell. He'll set you straight before you get it going. He'll be back with us here next week. Browns and the Steelers, as I mentioned, that'll be Sunday. Dan Wismar will be here on Monday to join us and help break it down and talk about it. Will the Browns upset the Steelers in Pittsburgh? I guess we'll uh, find out about that one together on Sunday, and we'll talk about it on Monday. Before we get there, Saturday, you got the Buckeyes, 9-0, and looking to make it 10, as they've got a noon kickoff against the Fighting Illini of Illinois. Let me take you Last chance to get a big feel-good blowout going before the final two with Michigan State and Michigan to end the season. Uh, Buckeyes got the 14th-ranked Spartans and then the 15th-ranked Wolverines coming up back-to-back the next couple of weeks. But it starts with Illinois and JT Barrett back under center for the Buckeyes as they take their number one Big Ten offense out there as well as the Big Ten winning streak, 29 in a row, and the longest winning streak in the country overall, 23 in a row for the Buckeyes. And we'll see if they can uh, impress the playoff committee as well and try to get themselves up a couple of notches there. Urban Meyer and the Buckeyes going as well for their 16th consecutive road victory. Urban Meyer has yet to lose a road game as the head coach of the Ohio State Buckeyes. Buckeyes have won seven straight against Illinois ever since that 2007 28-21 upset down at the Horseshoe. That should be a lot of fun. We'll talk about that with Dan Wismar as well on Monday. You've got the Browns. You've got the Buckeyes. You've got the Cavaliers who have two in play this weekend. It starts with the New York Knickerbockers and the Cavaliers back-to-back games on the road here this weekend. The Knicks, uh, Carmelo, Porzingis. Porzingis looked good against the Cavs uh, in that game that they played at the Q last week. As uh, he's he's an active guy. I know Melo didn't like him, but he's out there, man. He can hit the three. He, can, he hit that three, by the way, the other night. I don't know if you guys saw it, and it, it was, the fingertips were still on the ball as it hit the buzzer, but he nailed that game winner that got waved off for them. The Knicks, they bring some fight. I mean, obviously, they're a lesser light still, but they're bringing some fight. I think they're a game under 500 on the early part of the season here. Then they got the Bucks. This is the first of three in a row here coming up on the road. Knicks tonight, Bucks tomorrow. Got the big Greg Monroe there. Obviously, Alphabet, Giannis Antetokounmpo out there and uh, they got some good studs on that Bucks team. That's a good young squad. I think they're one of the young squads in the East coming up. Then you got the Pistons and big old Andre Drummond and company coming up on Tuesday as they wrap up that road trip before they come back home for three next Thursday. They got Milwaukee, Atlanta, and Orlando on tap at the queue. Knicks and the Bucks, the two teams on the uh, schedule this weekend. We'll get into all of that on Monday as well. Great college football all over the place, starting with the Buckeyes. Got the full slate of NFL action this weekend, you guys. CSU and Akron, as I mentioned, as the Buckeyes and the Vikings basketball teams get tipped off this weekend. The Monsters back in action, the Blue Jackets, and so much more. We'll be back here Monday with Dan Wismar doing the thing, and we'll talk about it all, guys. Same bat time, same bat channel, live at noon right here across the Sports Fix Radio Network. We love you, Cleveland and beyond. I hope to see you, not just Monday, hope to see you tomorrow live in Erie, Pennsylvania, Saga Club is the site. 7 p.m. is bell time for the 8th anniversary spectacular for Pro Wrestling Rampage. I will be there front and center, one of the stars of the party. So come on out, have some fun with us, and then get back here Monday, and let's talk about it all and then some. Same bat time, same bat channel. You know the spiel, noon, baby, right here on The Fix. We love you, Cleveland and beyond, and I will see you this Monday right here. Live on the Sports Fix.